Some call it confusion. Other call it informative. But say what you will, it happened. We're speaking of the Trump interview at the NABJ conference this past week. We're talking with Lisa Golly, Emmy Award winning producer and also NSU alum who was in the room to tell us exactly what took place. It's Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville, and you're joining us for our show of In the Room, the Trump interview at NABJ. We'll be right back in just a moment. It's Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. We thank you for joining us, as you always do, on this beautiful Sunday that we're having here in Hampton Roads. And we hope that you're having a beautiful Sunday where you're listening to us, because we know that our listeners tune in from all over the country and the world. We want to thank you for your support, your continued support, and we hope that you're enjoying, continuing to enjoy your summer. And we're also grateful to be all, to be broadcasting, as we do every Sunday, from the campus of the Norfolk State University home of the Spartan Nation from none other than WNSB Hot 91, the soul of VA. Well, you know, a lot of you tune into this show and you have over the course of over three years. And I was taking a look at our past shows. We've got over 175 shows under our belt already. And and it's only because of the grace of God and, and his, his greatness and you, the supporters, that we're able to do what we do. You know, and over the course of this time that we've brought movers, shakers, and policymakers to you to discuss issues important to the community, you know, we've had so many informative, informative shows and guests, you know, talk, talk about so a myriad of, of, of things and, and issues in our local community, our commonwealth, and also our country and the world. But I think to today's show is going to rank up there. It's probably one of the most unique shows that we've had uh, during this tenure that we've had with State of the Water. You know, it we're going to cover what everybody's still talking about today. And that is none other than the Trump interview that took place at the National Association of Black Journalists uh, annual conference, which was held in Chicago this past week. Now, for those of you that follow me and have followed me for years, you know that I was fortunate enough to uh, receive a an award in uh, as the top commentary in the country market 16 and below uh, there at NABJ and so thankful for what NABJ does and, and also the history that NABJ has. Our black journalists, our black newspapers, our black uh, reporters, producers, Everyone plays a vital role in what journalism is about, getting information from an African-American perspective, but also to our communities uh, across the country. And we have with us to discuss who was in the room during the time of the Trump interview. It's none other than my good friend. She is no stranger to Hampton Roads and no stranger to NSU. She's one of our great alums. And that's none other than Lisa Golly, who is the executive producer, of many things over at WHRO, WHRV, and you hear her across across the airways. She does a lot of phenomenal things and, and has racked in quite a few Emmys along the way. Lisa, thank you for joining us here on Stay in the Water. Eric, it's my pleasure. You know, again, as, as we talk, as I mentioned before, you know, this is something that's being talked about, you know, still to this day. You know, people are asking, you know, what do you think about the interview that happened? You know, uh, in Chicago, you know, with with Trump, what do you think about, you know, why didn't he answer any questions and, and so forth and so on? And, and there, there there are a myriad of, of of opinions about this. But one thing is for sure, anywhere this man goes, he creates controversy. You know, Lisa, you know, I, I, I want to delve into this first and then we'll talk about NABJ and, and the Hampton Roads uh, chapter toward the end. But you were in the room during this interview. You know, take it away. Tell us, first of all, how was it being in the room seeing this firsthand? Well, um, again, I have to be very, very, very honest with you, Eric. When by the time everything was said and done, and it was a 32-minute interview, by the time everything was said and done, I, I really felt nauseous. I, I really felt sick to my stomach. I felt like I had to come back up to my room and lie down. I mean, it was just, mm. <laughs> it was that kind of emotion that took place in that room. And it wasn't just me. We were looking, you know, I was looking at other journalists and some were like, I, I, I don't even know what to say. I, I don't even know where to begin with and begin to process all this that I've heard. But it was, 
<laughs> it was just like that. Huh? <laughs> well, well, I tell you what. Let Let's start at the very beginning, okay? So it was announced that former President Donald Trump and current nominee of the Republican Party for the 2024 presidential election was going to appear, make an appearance for an interview at NABJ. And a lot of persons were saying, why are they inviting him there? Why is he actually going to get this time, you know, with with our journalists at our conference? Can you tell us, can you tell our audience uh, why he was invited? And is this something that usually takes place? Well, this is something that always happens at, at NABJ. We always invite um, the the candidates, particularly in an election year. We always invite the candidates to come and, and take questions from um, our selected uh, moderators and panelists to just so we can get a perspective and find out exactly where they're coming from. This has been going on since the 70s. Now, I wasn't a member of an APJ back then, but when I when I arrived here, I was speaking to one of our founders, and she uh, pulled up her phone and started showing me letters that had been sent to Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter and and George Bush, and you know some of them accepted. I think all actually all three of them accepted to be. Um, um, guest here for NABJ, but this is something that's been going on for decades in terms of inviting political candidates here to NABJ, and and this wasn't the first time Donald Trump has been invited. He's been invited throughout his presidency. He was invited. He turned us down each and every time, but this time he said yes. You know, I I think it's very important, Lisa, that, you know, the, the public understands that part of the history, you know, that this is something that has always taken place. You know, where you invite elected officials and candidates uh, to the conference, you know, to be questioned by journalists, <laughs> as more specifically black journalists. Did you think it was it was interesting that this year he said yes, as opposed to all the other years of the last five years uh, when he won, when he was running for president uh, back in 2016 and then uh, the four years that he was president? Actually, Eric, I didn't. Because I've I've come to to see how the former president likes to control the news cycle, and this time he has not been controlling ever since um, the vice president, uh, or I should say the president um, recommended the vice president for his position. Um, she's controlled the news cycle. Everything has been about Kamala, and I think he said, "Okay, well, my turn," and he actually did. Because it has been in constant news and in constant conversation ever since. You know, one thing that the, the former president does, and I say this all the time, you know, he he denies, he brings confusion and distraction. <laughs> and, and to your point, he controls the news cycle with that confusion and and, and also distractions. Everything. You know, did he state a true form during the interview? Yes. Um, you know, one of the, one of the moderators said said that she was surprised at his actions, and I, I don't I don't really think anybody everybody knows what he's capable of of saying. Uh, we've seen it countless times. I, I remember uh, the first time I, I heard him call April Ryan nasty um, or or a loser, and I was kind of shocked. Then I was like, is that a president, a sitting president, saying something like this to a journalist? And so I, I know what, what happens. I know what he's capable of saying. But I, I, have, to, um, I have to commend Rachel Scott, who, who started out, and, and he said that she didn't um, introduce him, say hello, but I saw her shake his hand and welcome him. It just wasn't on an open mic you know, sort of situation. Once he had sat down, she didn't do it, but she did shake his hand and welcome him at the beginning of the interview. And I thought she was very professional. I thought she she handled herself incredibly well, even though he did not answer the questions that she asked. I thought she handled herself incredibly well. She kept addressing him as sir, and and he would ask her questions, and she would repeat it. She would answer him, but, you know, he, he tried to take it off track, and she kept bringing it back. So I thought she did an excellent job. You know, let's let, let's get into the interview now. And um, <laughs> so you said it was 32 minutes. And for those of you that want to see it, that missed it, you can go to YouTube. Just put in Trump interview NABJ, right? And you'll pop right up. 
and uh, you could see it for yourself. You know, when when the former president walked out, how was the reception? Was it cheers? Was it <laughs> booze? I mean, were people like, oh, Lord, here we go? You mean at the very beginning? Yes, yes, the very beginning. Um, well, he <laughs> he paused as if he were waiting for a standing ovation or people to cheer, and it wasn't there. There were some people clapping. But being you know, but you could tell it was a respectful type clap and not a yay he's here kind of clap. Um, and I think he he stopped and he looked around as if to say, "Where are my cheers?" Um, and I, and I, I I thought that was interesting the way he stopped when he first came out and kind of just like, "Well, you guys aren't cheering for me and I'm here." Um, and again, <laughs> like we're, we're journalists, we're here to to, to talk to you. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, now, now I want to get it, get to some of the questions. So, you know, as you said, the questions were being asked, but he really didn't answer questions that he felt that he uh, that would kind of back him up. And and it's kind of interesting because the theme of this year's conference is holding, you know, accountability for the most part and right. and and dealing with misinformation or disinformation. You have the miss and a disinformation in chief on stage you know did you get a feeling that he was dodging answering questions well he never likes to look bad um under under any kind of circumstance and and um name calling and and skirting is something he's he's very good at um when it comes to not taking the attention off of what the question was. Well, Rachel Scott laid out all of the things he had done that, that had been disrespectful um, to people of color, um, talking about, you know, Barack Obama and his birth. I mean, she laid it out, that first question, right off the bat. He said it was rude, but she laid it out. She talked about the, the, the congresswomen and, and how he had, you know, spoken to them. I mean, she went down, you know, item by item. And his response was, well, you're being rude to me. No, she asked you a question, and let's hear you know your response to that. But he never responded to that. He laid on the fact that he was he was being attacked, that that this reporter was being rude to him, and what she was doing was her job. She asked him a question, which he never answered, because <laughs> um, she wanted to know why should black voters vote for you based on your history and how you and your relationship with black people, how you have address them. He later got into money that he's given to HBCUs and, and other things that he's done for the black community. But at that moment, at that moment, after that first question, he was more interested in making sure people knew that he did not like what she had said to him. She was being rude to him. And, and that was that. I mean, he even talked about how the equipment from NABJ wasn't, wasn't good equipment. And that was what the holdup was because he uh, would, was not going to be late for this interview because he's being respectful of our time. And it was interesting to me that he used the word respectful. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it is what it is. You know, one of the, um, I felt that when he was backed into the wall, or backed up against the wall, he started then to, instead of dodging questions, he started attacking the person asking the question. As a matter of fact, he called one of the moderators. He said, he told him nasty and rude. What was, you know, and again, you have a man talking to a woman and, of course, you know, Trump talking to a black female. You know, how did that, how did that dynamic feel when he was railing at her for being nasty and rude? Well, you know, we, we, were, we all felt it. You know, we all felt it, and it was just like, why he, she asked you a question? Again, I, I think Rachel Scott did a phenomenal job. She stayed on point and on task the entire time. And even when there were gasps in the room, when the former president said, you know, that, that, that Kamala Harris had become black, um, she started out Indian and she became black, and there were gasps in the room because most of us who know her history knew she went to an HBCU. She pledged a black sorority. Come on. We, we, she said, you know, from the beginning, she identifies as a black woman. Where is this coming from? So, you know. You know, I, again, I thought it was just one, again, deny, distract, and cause confusion. Yeah. Lisa, after the interview took place, there was a 
clip circulating uh, with Roland Martin. Uh, where he's having a confrontation with someone who used to be uh, on Fox and questioning, you know, uh, he's questioning Roland Martin, whether he's a journalist or not. And they're questioning going back and forth after the, you know, of course you say you felt nauseous (laughs) afterwards, but what was the conversation like amongst uh, colleagues in the lobby and, and afterwards after the interview? Oh, there were quite a few. <laughs> I heard everything from I need a drink to um, I, I I feel like I need to throw up. I heard you know I heard a couple of I've, I've heard a little bit of everything afterward um, in terms of the conversations. We still had, and it seemed to come a lot more from the younger journalists who felt like he just never should have been invited in the first place. Um, and then you know the older I've heard I heard a couple of the um, older or I should say veteran journalists saying well this was this was a lose lose situation for an ABJ because you know this is you know we we are divided now because you know younger journalists versus veteran journalists feeling this is a good idea it's not a good idea. Um, where are we going with this? How will NABJ be portrayed in the news? Will we come across looking, you know, how how will this be? What will this, you know, end up looking like? So there, those were those kinds of conversations, and, and they went on throughout the day. They just went on throughout the day, just different conversations from different people about what, what this was going to bring. You know, Lisa, of course, this candidate is controversial, will continue to be controversial in Him actually appearing there in NABJ will be controversial from now until. But from your perspective, was it important for the former president, now nominee of the Republican Party for president, to be there? I think so. I think so because it gave us an opportunity that we would probably never have to ask him questions. Now, did he answer them? Most of them, no. But it was an opportunity for us to sit 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 down with him and ask him questions, pressing questions. I was kind of disappointed that we didn't get to, to the 2025 plan to talk about that, but I don't know that he would have answered that, but we'll never know because we, we ran out of time. But it, it's, it was an opportunity, and I feel like we should always take advantage of those opportunities when we have not when we have a chance to sit down and talk to leaders, particularly in politics, about their decision making, about their plans, how it will affect different different areas, different groups, particularly the black community. Where are you going with this? Why did you do this? Can we talk to you about your past? How will that impact your future decisions? I think having those opportunities is key as a journalist. But that's my personal opinion. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, your opinion matters quite a bit, especially here, you know, in the Hampton Roads area, where you are truly, truly a living legend amongst us and a proud Spartan as well. It's Stay the Water. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Laville. You're joining us, as you always do on a Sunday, as we discuss In the Room. We're talking with Lisa Golly, Emmy Award winning uh, producer. An NSU alum, as she sat in the room at the NABJ conference in Chicago this past week during the Trump interview. She's giving perspectives by being in the room and uh, hearing and seeing it live, but also being an award winning journalist and the value of the interview itself. Lisa, if you could look at one moment in the interview, you know, what would probably be your your the, the, the best question you thought was asked and, and exchanged between the nominee and the moderators. You talking about the best exchange? Well, <laughs> right. The best exchange that, that you saw. Hmm. You know, there were so many questions and follow up questions that that weren't answered. I just the best exchange. I don't know. I, I, t- I was taking notes. so I'm trying to kind of think back on on some of the things i i had a a problem when um the question about whether the vice president was a dei hire yes yes and he asked what what was the definition what does that mean he was like explain dei and i'm like come on now seriously <laughs> exactly so, he and he repeatedly asked and 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 rachel scott said sir i've already answered that <laughs> But he repeatedly kept asking. You could tell he did not want to answer that question. Um, 
So I don't know, you know, and, and, and the young people are saying, or the younger journalists are saying, you know, we, we knew we weren't going to get anything. I don't know why we wasted our time. But I felt like just the opportunity to ask it was important to take advantage of it. So I, you know, I, I, I actually, um, when he talked about the vice president, mm-hmm. the vice presidency after ha- having made his appointment, and he said, you know, that that was um, the choice of a vice president makes no difference. My mouth did drop open, especially since it had just been, you know, what, a couple of weeks since somebody had, had attempted to take his life. Right. The response was the choice of a vice president makes no difference. I was like, huh? <laughs> really? Okay. You know, you know, Lisa, one of the conversations that we've been a part of in talking with colleagues is that we notice the, you know, the dynamics on stage and we noticed that there were no men moderators. Do you think you it would have made it? That said that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think it would have made a difference if, let's just say, a Roland Martin was there on stage or Ed Gordon, you know, was there on stage or maybe a. Uh, 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 a general manager of a news, African-American general manager of a news station was actually on stage asking these questions? You know, Eric, I don't know. I don't know if it would have made that much of a difference. Um, But he doesn't tend to, with the exception of Barack Obama and the things he said about him, I, I haven't heard him say a lot of direct insults to black males. Now, whether he has, and I've missed a lot of them, I mean, but I, I haven't heard a lot of them, not like I've heard the the disrespect to black females. Not, I mean, it's, it, to me, it, it would be like two or three to one, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I I, I don't know if um, he may have, have retracted and been a little more on, on track in terms of answering the questions if he had, you know, been given a question by a, by a African-American male, but I'm not sure. I don't know with with uh, the former president's track record if he, if it would have made a difference. I'm not sure. Some believe it would have, but I, I don't know. I can't really say for sure. Now, I, I want to address the controversy that led up to this and the fallout with NABJ. As a matter of fact, when it was announced that the former president would be a guest uh, there, um, there were uh, there was a tweet out where one of the co-chairs for the conference actually resigned you know, from the conference because of it. Uh, in addition to that, there were also others that showed discontent uh, for the entire decision. Can you tell us what was the fallout from it? Was this something that was well conceived or is this something that now there's conversation about how to go about this in the future? You know, I've, I've been asked this question a couple of times and I'm I'm that's among the leadership in terms of um <laughs> who the moderators are and and um who who gets the invitation but like i said earlier in the beginning of our interview we've always invited the political candidates um but the younger um journalists aren't convinced that that's the way it needs to be particularly when it's a candidate that has been just so disrespectful and and so uncaring and so unconcerned about issues impacting the black community um, Donald Trump says he's the best thing to happen to the black community since Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> there are a lot of people in that room that did not agree with that. So, um, you know, it, 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 it goes back and forth. And I hate to see the division um, in the organization. We are the, the largest organization of, of African-American or journalists of color, I should say, in the world. And I hate to see any kind of division. I'm, I'm hoping um, that we can go move forward and we can have conversations and we can talk about this among each other and, and try to figure out our best ways to move forward with this and how we will handle situations like this in the future because there are some definite opinions on how it should have been handled and how it should be handled in the future. So we'll have to see where that goes. Absolutely. Now, I want to segue to NABJ. The National Association of Black Journalists is the largest organization of African American uh, journalists, uh, whether it be uh, television, newspaper, you name it, 
uh, podcasters, <laughs> podcasters, uh, bloggers, and the like. And, and it's an annual conference that takes place, but it's more than just that. Tell us a little bit about the history of NABJ, why it's important, and our Hampton Roads chapter of NABJ that you serve as president of. Well, the history goes back to how we were being treated in newsrooms years, years, and years ago, and and having a support base, you know, a group of people that could gather together, that could talk about the things that they were going through, and and talk about how we can bring more more people who look like us into the industry, and what's needed to be done to get people who look like us in in managerial positions, in terms of the news making. I don't think a lot of people understand the importance of having um, a diverse newsroom when it comes to reporting issues and what a difference it makes. I'm going to give you a, a, a quick example. When I was a reporter at, at Channel 3 and, and Barbara Ham Lee was the news director, there was an issue of you know all the descriptions we would get from police about um, say, for example, a robbery suspect, and it would say African-American male, six feet tall, blue jeans, white T-shirt, tennis shoes. And you walk outside and you see 15 people that look like that. So it's like, okay. So the decision was made, and Barbara made that decision. We're not going to send out these these uh, descriptions anymore unless they're a little more, you know, distinctive. Does the person have a tattoo? Do they have braids? Do they, you know, do they, you're going to have to give us more than, than a black male, six feet tall, blue jeans, a T-shirt, and tennis shoes. It's just you, you got to do better than that. And those kinds of decisions come when you have people of color in charge and they're seeing why are we doing this like this? This isn't this isn't right. It doesn't make sense. Let's let's move forward and let's let's try to do better. And and it's an important thing. And NABJ has been been critical throughout time in terms of training younger people to do better, training middle management um, individuals to to get to a point where they can take top jobs and and do better and and change what the the look of a newsroom looks like and make sure that there are people representing, you know, the different diverse areas of a community. So it 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 has been um you know it's been the lifeblood of 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 black journalists for such a long time and it's an important such an important organization. And tell us about the Hampton Rose chapter of NABJ and the work that you guys are doing in the last few moments here. Well, um we do we we are here for our journalists here in Hampton Roads. It has been uh, for 4 years I served as the president. Eugene Daniel is now the new president of of Hampton Roads Black Media Professionals, but it is an organization on a more local level to help our our young people and and journalists who like I said have been middle of their career even at the end of their career who who might need uh guidance or who might need someone to to um, bounce something off of, and it's just important. I, when I come back and and we start again in September, I'm going to be the superintendent of the Journalism Academy, which is an arm of um, Hampton Roads Black Media Professionals, and there we deal, we work with middle school students, high school students, college students who are interested in media, and they get exposed to veteran journalists who can talk to them about what, what's going on and can critique little projects and assignments that they work on. So that they so by the time they get to a point where they're ready for their first job, they know exactly what they're doing. Absolutely. Eugene Daniels, who's also a good friend and also from WBC Channel 13 here in Hampton Roads. Lisa, as always, it is phenomenal to talk with you, my good friend, my sister. And we're also so proud of you as an NSU alum and the great things that you're doing and all the Emmys that you're winning. Continue to win on. You're going to have to build a separate room for that trophy case. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us, as, as you always do, uh, on this Sunday as we talked about in the room, the Trump interview at NABJ. Until next time, be good, be great, God bless, and we'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Kerry Washington, and you're listening to State of the Water with award-winning host, Dr. Eric Claville.